Good morning. I'm Kenya McDuffie, council member at large and chair of the council's committee on business and economic development. Today is Thursday, June 22nd, 2023, and we're convening this round table in person via the Zoom application. The time is now 11.05 a.m. and I'm calling this oversight round table to order. Today, the committee will receive testimony from two government witnesses, uh, DC Auditor Kathy Patterson and Chief Financial Officer Glenn Lee. The topic of today's roundtable is the implementation of the District Integrated Financial System, or DIFS, as it's also known. DIFS is the new financial management system for district government brought online to replace the uh, SOAR system. Although DIFS went live in October 2022, there are some significant operational issues with the system. Recently, the OCFO submitted to the Council for approval a new proposed contract which signals a shift in the OCFO's implementation strategy. Also earlier this month, as part of the council's budget, $15 million in capital funds were restored specifically to fund implementation of an Oracle budget module. This put back funding that was cut by the executive in a previous budget cycle. Today, we're gonna to hear more uh, of the OCFO's plan for that funding, hopefully. More generally, the committee has heard from key stakeholders concerns that the DIF system is not functioning as expected, that some of the data and reports generated are inaccurate, that agency and council users cannot generate basic reports necessary to reconcile agency spending to the budget. Uh, we're going to cover some of these issues in the depth at today's roundtable. Uh, and over the coming months, the committee will continue to work with the district government stakeholders, uh, including the auditor and the OCFO on DIFs. The auditor is here to offer testimony and provide context for some concerns regarding the implementation work to date and the functional problems which have emerged. The CFO is here to offer testimony on the need for the proposed contract, his overall strategy for ensuring DIFS meets the needs and requirements of district government, and an update on the progress of the rollout. I'm gonna call now um, the DC auditor. And before I ask you to begin your testimony, I'm going to say good morning and, and ask, actually swear you in. Uh, we swear in all the government witnesses before the committee. Uh, and I would like to be able to do that right now. So if you don't mind raising your right hand. And good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony that you're about to provide before the Council of the District of Columbia and the Committee on Business and Economic Development is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning again. Uh, I'm glad you were able to join us and you can begin your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. McDuffie. And good morning. As stated, I'm Kathy Patterson, District of Columbia Auditor. <clears throat> and I appreciate the invitation to appear before you today to share questions and concerns that my staff and I have about the district's new enterprise financial system, the district integrated financial system, or DIFS, as you noted. Included with my testimony are charts that show major expenditures for DIFS based on reports generated this week, and my full statement is on the DC Auditor website. <clears throat> my focus is primarily on the budget capabilities of DIF DIFS, and my context is having served as a council member during the development of the DIFS predecessor, the System of Accounting and Reporting, or SOAR. As an individual council member, I was very much involved in outlining what was needed and what was expected of SOAR, <clears throat> which included budget transparency, not just for government officials, but for the public as well. Working with colleagues in the Williams administration, we also jointly developed the companion to the actual system, performance-based budgeting, with a lofty aim of enabling all policymakers, as well as the public, to much more fully understand how and where every taxpayer dollar is spent. In council testimony in 2004, Bert Molina, then Deputy CFO for Budget and Planning, explained the value of performance-based budgeting as an adjunct to SOAR. It is, he said, an accountability tool, both from a budgetary and performance perspective that brings transparency to government and will improve how the district budgets for and assesses program results. <clears throat> as I'm sure you're aware, Mr. McDuffie, and as we have documented in reports, the statutory requirements of the performance-based budgeting have long been discarded. There are no annual agency business plans to clearly explain how what all the services are that our tax dollars pay for. Agency budgets are never offered at the service level or the third level of detail so that you and the public can better understand precisely where the dollars go. When SOAR was implemented, council staff were given training on running reports from the system, so each office wouldn't be able to know on a daily basis the status of each agency's spending. When I returned to district government at the end of 2014, after an absence of eight years, all this had changed. 
Rather than a partnership among branches of government, the financial system had become wholly owned and protected by the office of the chief financial officer. Very few, if any, council staff had or have direct access to the system or the knowledge of how to run reports. Only my agency fiscal officers at ODCA had this capability. And to get trained to access and use the system for budget reports required the express permission of the CFO himself. In addition, regular financial reports like the financial review process, FRP, monthly and quarterly reports with the details on the status of each agency spending are no longer circulated at the council. To their credit, the CFO did develop the CFO Info Dashboard that provided aggregate information on spending at the agency level, but that dashboard is useless today because the information posted is out of date. This provides my perspective on DIFFs and the current challenges with the budget application that was to have been a core part of the new system. As the auditor, I asked from the outset to be a part of the decision making and was rebuffed by the CFO leadership. The DIFFs director, Mr. Clark, was very forthcoming in providing briefings for my staff, and I appreciate that willingness. But there was never an attempt to reflect in the development and implementation what precisely would be the information of most value to the Office of the DC Auditor. From conversations with a few individual council members, I don't believe any significant effort was made to assess their priorities either, to ensure those priorities are reflected in the capabilities of the new system. As you noted, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> This roundtable was prompted by a new DIFFS contract submitted by the CFO to the council to spend $4.5 million in the initial year with Guidehouse Incorporation for, quote, fit gap analysis and remediation services for the DIFFS implementation. The contract language notes that since go live on October 1, it has become apparent that there are gaps in the ability of the system to fulfill all the business requirements of the district's agencies, clusters, and OCFO central office. Leading business practices may be partially implemented or not implemented. The gap analysis may well be necessary and a positive initiative. The language of the contract, though, raises questions, including the following, and I hope the committee will seek answers to all of these concerns. There were two major 2019 contracts with Deloitte Consulting, one for organizational change management or business process reengineering to proceed prior to the new system, and a larger contract to scope, plan, and implement the new system. An initial question is what specific business requirements are currently unfulfilled such that the pending contract is necessary? This is from the first paragraph of the Deloitte contract for organizational change management. The OCFO requires the contractor to provide organizational change management services to scope, plan, and implement the organizational changes required to support the new system, including identifying efficiencies leading to re-engineering the business processes supporting the new systems. According to a past report earlier this week, $24.6 million has been paid out under this Deloitte organizational change management contract. If the requisite organizational change management was either not identified or not completed, why not? What were the shortcomings of the work of Deloitte in this context? Did they fail to deliver on the specific terms of that contract? If they did fail, what action is planned to recover funds expended? Throughout the process of implementing the system, the district has had the benefit of an independent verification and validation contractor, Gartner, whose role was to look over the shoulder of Deloitte and the DIFFS team and identify risks and mitigate them. According to the original Gartner contract that included <clears throat> the enhanced by management in insight will result in additional confidence by the district that the solutions will satisfy the business needs and associated requirements for security availability and so forth. You may wish to ask the CFO if Gartner provided the services as contracted throughout the implementation process. More specifically, whether the regular reports that the contractor was required to submit identified any of the issues that it is anticipated this new gap analysis will be addressing. The pending contract is for, as I said, a fit gap analysis and remediation. And yet, even the original implementation contract with the Deloitte included in the blueprint phase a fit gap analysis. Was the original contract, the blueprint phase, fit gap analysis completed? Did it identify the business process and configuration issues that needed remediation? Were they identified? Were they remediated? And if not, why not? As you noted, Mr. Chairman, in approving the district's budget for FY24, the council added 15 million to cover the budget implementation. 
This begs the question on the development and implementation of DIFFs. Budget formulation is arguably the most important functionality from the point of view of you, the council, the district's elected policymakers. As you might expect, the 2019 contract for DIFFs implementation was sprinkled throughout with many, many references to the new budget application to be provided as part of the enterprise system. My statement includes examples from that contract and all the references to the budget module that was to have been a, a key part of this implementation. Again, the overarching question, when and how did completing the budget capabilities of DIFF get dropped and why? Going back to the record at the OCFO's performance hearing in February, the OCFO's PowerPoint states this, reminder, 15 million was removed from the project as part of the FY21-23 approved budgets. If not restored, this will impact the implementation of the budget system. The April budget testimony added, <clears throat> As a result, OCFO is unable to complete the implementation of the Oracle budget module as planned. Also in April, Chairman Mendelson raised questions about the DIFFS funding at the Committee the Whole Budget Hearing for the Office of Budget and Planning. Asked specifically about the reported reduction in funding for that budget module, Deputy CFO Eric Kennedy said, quote, the mayor's office decided to use the 15 million for something else. He also told the Committee the Whole that the current plan as of April was to quote, home grow a budget module. And until that was accomplished, the development of the budget each year would be a manual process. To further muddy these waters, a review of the budget we submitted to the Congress in FY, for FY 2023 indicated the budget's authorization was increased from 163 to 174 million. This is for DIFFs. Questions, how was the change Mr. Kennedy described actually effectuated the executive's decision to reallocate 15 million from the DIFF's capital budget? And was the council aware of this change? Did the council give its explicit approval in approving the budgets? And if there was an increase in the authorization of 11 million a year ago, what was the purpose of that increase? There are additional issues that I have from an agency perspective, specifically, the process that requires employees to submit travel cash advances and expenses. That's created a major headache for employees and has resulted in delays in reimbursement. This raises a question of what training has been provided. Has it been sufficient? Why are employees having these challenges nine months after go live? It has been difficult to run the daily, monthly, and quarterly reports, as the chairman noticed, noted. Does the CFO planning is the CFO planning to provide additional training so that they can ease so staff can easily generate reports? What happens now in moving forward? It's my understanding the Deloitte team was disbanded. The budget presented to the council this spring had no capital project for the office of the chief financial officer. There is no entry at all for DIFFs, even for what Mr. Kennedy described as a homegrown budget alternative. How had the CFO intended to pay for the homegrown varietal? And what are the plans now with additional funding? Will there be any accountability for a new system that is said to have been implemented on time and on budget and yet implemented without a fully functioning budget application? I assume the council will approve the contract with Guidehouse and I believe that may be the right step. Depending on what that analysis finds, you may wish to ask the CFO what his appetite will be for holding the principal contractors on DIF, DIFF's implementation Deloitte and Gartner accountable for any identified failures. As an experienced financial leader who was not a part of district government when most of the DIFF's decisions were made, Mr. Lee may have a very informative perspective on what might have been done differently and what lessons should be learned from the current situation. I have a series of additional questions in my written testimony and I encourage the committee to seek answers to these questions, including the current role of the CFO's Office of the Chief, Finan Chief Information Officer, how and whether Gartner determined that all the training had been provided such that Go Live could go forward successfully. What are the liabilities today from delays in payments? Are we under liabilities under the Quick Payment Act? And I encourage you to seek questions to all these, um, seek answers to all these questions. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my testimony and I'd be happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you very much and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you, uh, Ms. Patterson. I really appreciate your testimony and, and uh, all the insights from you and your 
team leading up to today's roundtable. Uh, just a few questions, and and I, I appreciate, again, how you laid out some additional questions that uh, even if we don't get to today in this roundtable, we will be posing to the CFO um, to get answers to. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. You mentioned in your testimony um, some historical context around SOARS. Um, and I wanted to delve a little bit into that, uh, given that it's the predecessor system that DIFFS replaced. Um, what, what lessons, if any, uh, in your experience, dating back to when you were a council member and, and, and juxtaposing that with your role as an auditor today, what lessons, lessons if any, should we carry over to DIFFS uh, implementation from um, how SOAR was implemented? Because my understanding, there was some some problems that I think the city ran into while implementing SOARs. Well, there certainly were issues. It's and, and clearly, it's there are always issues with implementing a new information technology system. And I don't mean to minimize that at all. And training is always an important part. I think what has been very different in this time around from my experience with SOAR as a council member was, frankly, the role of the legislature in having a say about what it is that you want to see, particularly from the budget module and a new financial system. And since we don't have that budget uh, application right now, I think going forward, something I would encourage the council to do is to be very deeply involved in what does that, what does the uh, implementing the Oracle budget module look like? And will it give you as an oversight chairman, what you need with regard to the agencies that you have responsibility for overseeing? That's what I would really encourage the council and all of the council committees to really get deeply involved in going forward from right now. I appreciate that. And do you do you remember what, if any, role the auditor played in the implementation of SOAR? I actually don't know what role the auditor played. I only know what role council members played because that was the role that I had at the time. Okay. Okay. Um, I um, you, you listed a number of questions throughout your testimony, some of which I've highlighted and I'll try to get to there. But then, as you mentioned in your testimony, you list a number of additional questions at the end of it. And so, as I stated earlier, uh, whatever we don't get to today, we'll plan to pose to the CFO and perhaps um, his testimony will answer some of the questions that have already uh, been posed in your testimony. Um, let me ask you this though, have you had a chance to talk to uh, CFO Lee uh, in any discussions around DIFFS? Not recently, we did have a courtesy meeting four days into go live. And uh, I realized that there was still very much um, the implementation issues were front and center for him that day, last October. So no, we have not had any one-on-one -on -one conversations more recently. Okay, okay. And in terms of access that the auditor has to the system, if you could just put that on the record again, like what kind of access do you all have? Because I have a, an experienced and talented agency fiscal officer, we have whatever can be gotten from the new system we can get because we do have uh, that capability. But it's not readily translated. It's not readily um, provided in terms of training. But because I do have an experienced AFO, we do have access. That's the way we were able to generate the reports that are in my testimony today. And and, and you put something else uh, on the record in your testimony that I thought was important, which I'm trying to find in one of my multiple tabs. Give me one moment. But you talked about um, the, the the statutory requirements of performance-based budgeting. Um, right. Your experience under the Williams administration obviously is different than what's going on now, but um, you know, what do you think happened along the way? Obviously you weren't in government during that time frame of about uh, several years before you got back to, to to government as the auditor, but have you been able to ascertain, uh, you know, any sort of event that might have occurred to sort of get us away from the performance-based budgeting requirements under the code? I think I can mention two things. One, I'm very well aware that producing annual business reports that outline every service an agency provides is very time and labor intensive. I think that's an exercise that's well worth doing, but it, I acknowledge it's labor intensive. And I think that's one of the reasons that the executive branch agency and the Fannie administration going forward chose simply not to do that. 
The other big factor here is the capability within the CFO's Office of Budget and Planning to have staff designated specifically for the performance-based budgeting exercises. And there were three or four people um, in the Williams administration. I think there are zero today. And I know that's something that happened during the Fenty administration. There's an, uh, an ODCA report that we issued in that period of time looking at some of these issues. And it includes, one of the backup documents includes an email from the then head of Capstat, now the city administrator, noting the loss of staff in allocated to performance-based budgeting within the Office of the Budget and Planning at OCFO. So I think those two things really were part of it. The difficulty um, on the part of the executive branch not wanting to do this labor-intensive work, but also um, the, basically a decision by the CFO at that time to simply not allocate staff to performance-based budgeting. Yeah, and I appreciate you, 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 you mentioning that. And again, providing some more historical context. Uh, in addition to us, the committee following up with you and your team, I'm sure we're going to be talking to the chairman uh, and his team as well, uh, given their oversight of the Office of Management and Budget. And so uh, I want to thank you for your testimony and all your work leading up to today. I look forward to our engagement uh, following this roundtable. Thank you very much, Mr. McDuffie. I'm now going to turn to our, our second panel with uh, our CFO, Glenn Lee. And before we allow you to provide your testimony, uh, I want to swear you in, if you don't mind raising your right hand. You swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to provide before the Council of the District of Columbia and the Committee on Business and Economic Development is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Good morning to you and you Good morning. your testimony. Thank you very much. Good morning. And to you and members of the committee, I'm, as you mentioned, Glenn Lee, Chief Financial Officer of the Government of the District of Columbia, and I'm very pleased to be here with you this morning to talk about DIFFS. Um, what I'd like to do is describe our current efforts to implement the new system and some of the issues that we're having and our plans moving forward. So uh, if we could uh, please go to the presentation. Um, there we go, thank you. Next page, please. The DIFF system, otherwise uh, is an acronym, of course, for a district integrated financial system, as you pointed out. And it's a modern cloud-based uh, system that executes and records the district's financial transactions. Uh, just to hit a point that, uh, that the auditor made, it is a foundation system upon which you can add different modules, for example, a budget module, mod very specific modules to track grants and manage grants, capital assets, and so forth. But you start with a core financial transaction system that's cloud-based. That's the current best practice, and that's what we've implemented. Our partners and our organization implemented went live on October uh, 1st, roughly uh, 2022 for fiscal year 23. Um, looking back at the records, that was the planned date when the project was initially started in 2019. And um, as of uh, June, we have spent 100 and, uh, roughly $159 million on the project and expect to spend another 30 before the system is implemented, which is within the budget that was provided for the dis, uh, for OCFO to implement the system. And there's just a, a little bit of confusion. Our total budget is 206 million. That was reduced, I believe, a, a year or two ago to do away with implementing the budget module to two, 190. And so I'll reference 190 as our core budget to implement the financial system. Um, you know. In my experience, uh, working either directly implementing systems in jurisdictions I've worked with or working with uh, several uh, large city CFOs around the country is implementing a new financial system really takes three, um, three things to think about. First, configuring the new software. So uh, really that's about getting the system to do every step of a process the way you want and record transactions correctly. Second is, uh, and I think probably um, not stated nearly enough, is redesigning dozens and dozens of financial processes just to get a, a requisition processed all the way to pay a, a vendor or supplier. 
can take 40 or 50 steps, and each one of those steps has to be re-engineered when you're implementing a new system, often because a new system can't cope with the way a legacy system is managed those uh, processes. Oftentimes, a legacy system has not been best practice, so you don't even want to replicate that. So it, it you can spend literally two years re-engineering all of your financial processes certainly a year uh, to make sure that you understand exactly what you need from step the initial step of a, of a financial process all the way to its completion. Um, and then clearly the most important is the, the training and socialization of the new processes um, to your employees that have to execute the transactions as well as those that have to interpret those transactions. And that would be whether it's your accountants or your budget managers, or most importantly, your program managers, that they understand what reports are available and, and what they mean. And, and um, again, that's um, a very difficult um, aspect of implementation that, to measure. And you really measure it after you've gone live and see what people are routinely making mistakes about, and then try to adapt your training to those gaps. Um, next page, please. Just a little bit about what we're actually executing right now. Uh, DIFFS is processing and recording thousands of transactions worth billions of dollars. And what I wanted to do is show you uh, a comparison between last fiscal year and our current fiscal year for transactions from October to May. And as you can see, whether it's revenue, payroll, payments that we've made, both number or dollar amounts, were roughly at or above last year's level. All this to indicate that we are actually processing. There isn't billions of dollars of transactions that are being held up because we can't get them through the system. The system is, is executing transactions and recording uh, accurately, and we feel confident about that. That doesn't say we don't have many issues and uh, that we still have and challenges ahead of us, but just in the bigger context, we are executing transactions routinely and on time. Let's move to page four. So um, implementing, um, as, the, as the auditor mentioned, implementing a new system is extremely difficult. Uh, this is my second time with a financial system. I also implemented a new tax system and uh, an HR system. I was in the process when I moved here to this position. Uh, they're extremely challenging, largely because it's very difficult to engineer all your processes at the level of detail that you need to, and then match that with the appropriate training. That over and over again, those are the, um, the points of failure. The modern systems work. There isn't an issue with the system themselves. It's a matter of making sure that you've engineered your processes correctly and people understand how they work. Um, and that's um, that. those are the key struggles that, that you have. And one measure I have for people understanding a new system that I've adapted to over the years was not just that they learned how to do the routine in the new environment, but they knew how to solve out of the ordinary problems using the new environment. So you may change how to account for a particular complicated transaction. And then uh, let's say a federal grant for highway uh, maintenance. Those are very complicated. Um, you've probably re-engineered the system I, uh, to, to execute that. We've done that here. Um, there may be a new twist that the federal government is asking you to account for. It's when you watch your employees solve that uh, problem using the new system and techniques rather than to say, oh, in the old system, we used to do it this way. Maybe we can replicate that. It's a very subtle and nuanced point, but it takes a year or two before you get to that point where people are thinking in terms of how the new processes and the new system work, not hearkening back and trying to replicate what they used to do. And that's, that's a, a very difficult thing to measure, but you see it when it starts to happen. What are our challenges right now? Um, a lot of the early implementation problems had to do with converting data. Data about vendors, about suppliers, data about particular projects from the old system to the new system. 
And so that resulted in many, many situations where we were sending or about to send payments to a wrong entity. And I'll, I'll give you a good example. Um, we had an issue where if there were two entities that were affiliated with one another, let's pick state of Maryland and the University of Maryland, we make payments to both entities, but we didn't convert correctly for what kind of payments went to the University of Maryland, typically affiliated with UDC or our students versus what payments went to the state of Maryland. And there's many agreements that we have with the state to provide services. And so we had problems with that. That's a one-time issue, painful, but a one-time issue, largely resolved, but still there are gaps that we're working on to solve those issues. Um, and what that requires is that we have really good reconciliation processes to catch mistakes as they're being made um, and then rectify those so that we can make our payments and, and transactions on time. And I'm confident that we're doing well there. Um, another question is process design, um, both matching a process that's covered in a couple of different systems. We have uh, well over a dozen major systems that feed financial information to DIFFs and that we depend upon to execute financial transactions. In addition, we have um, engineered a handful of processes, and I think it was referred to by the auditor, um, for example, the um, expense reimbursement process. We over-engineered that. And uh, we had too many approval steps and the interface was difficult for employees to use. And so we have to re-engineer that and simplify it. We are implementing our new plan in, in, in the agency clusters. And uh, I understand that our new plan is working more smoothly, both most importantly for the users, but also within the financial system itself. You should expect that, that you don't engineer everything as well as you need to, and you have to adapt. And that's a good example. And we have many other situations like that that we're evaluating. And uh, finally, um, we did not have a full slate of reconciliation reports when we went live. We've since reconciled that. Uh, but that was um, personally, from my past experience, it was a bit nerve wracking for the first couple, three months not to have all our reconciliations in place. I am confident that we do now, but um, to give you a reference, in my last implementation, it took two years to get our cash reconciliation report sorted out. In the district, um, I understand that we're fully sorted out at this point in time. There's still some issues to work out, but uh, we're, we're, thanks to my talented staff, we're uh, ahead of that particular ex um, problem. So those are the issues that I think we have. Next slide, please. Um, so what am I focused on? What is our organization focused on? First and foremost um, is addressing the fiscal year 23 end and the audit process and then the act for process. You are not stable with your system until you have successful audit and published your annual report. And we won't call ourselves stable until that success has been achieved. And um, the fact that we can tr uh, transact now and record efficiently and meet our deadlines is beside the point. You got to get through your year-end processes. So that's my number one worry. And uh, to the extent my staff is organizing mock year-end processes, uh, I wish we would have done that in my prior uh, environment where we're simulating year end and taking a bunch of steps only with the data we have. So through May, for example, and simulating year end and finding many issues that we have to resolve that so far are resolvable, but that's a key, um, key issue for us is that to get through the year end process and have a, uh, a successful audit and a, and a clear publication on time. Um, Second is the processes are designed as efficiently as possible while maintaining internal controls, of course. Best practice suggests, and my experience indicates that it's really important around this time to review as much of your processes as you can to make sure that they're working well, you don't have surprises at your end, and to find better efficiencies in, in executing your financial transactions. Hence, that's why we have the contract that you are, are before the council right now. Um, and um, I, I, I personally have experienced using this kind of service 
Um, uh, you can use it at different stages of an implementation at the start, in the middle, which is what I did last time, or after we're implemented now, but it's essential uh, part of our success. And since it's within our budget, we feel confident this is the right move to make. We can talk more about that with your questions. Um, third thing I'm worried about is creating a sustainable oversight of the system and its use. And to me, that means first and foremost, a governance about how we handle systems, how we handle uh, changes to the system, and how we handle net new financial uh, challenges that we have within the system's confines. Second is set up a really good problem solving and help desk environment training and so forth. Thanks to council adds to our budget, uh, we have done that. And uh, we're uh, very uh, feeling comf comfortable with our fundings to support the system in the long run in that sense, problem solving and help desk support training and so forth. Financial reporting, always a bear with a new system, always a challenge with a new system. Um, our our um, reporting is improving constantly. We will be approving a year from now, we'll be getting better. It takes a, a couple of years before you feel like you have all the reporting mechanisms in place. That's a common experience. And then finally, an ongoing training program that's robust and inaccurate. Um, so next slide, please. And I know we're out of time and I do appreciate uh, you letting me um, complete this. Um, this is what I mentioned in my nomination presentation uh, that was a little over a year ago to this committee. Um, this is a quote about um, that implementing a new system is extremely difficult. It will be the majority of my time and effort after, for the first two years of my stay here. And 10 months in, I can tell you this is my number one concern. Clearly, we have other pressing financial issues we've spoken about. Um, but um, in the end, overseeing the, a successful implementation is my biggest concern. It was uh, before I um, officially received the job, and, and um, I see no different now. We have our challenges, but we also have our successes. And I will say one of the, the key differences that I'm experiencing here and what I've noticed in other jurisdictions that we have an advantage of is the talented staff we have. Uh, we're able to make up for some problems that we've identified by not only a talented group of business owners like Eric Kennedy, Kimberly Williams, Carmen Pigler, but also our systems uh, people are top notch. And so we're able to make up uh, for um, problems that we're having much more quickly than I would anticipate. And with that, I'll conclude, sir. And, and thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Lee, I do obviously have some questions and, yes, and we're not going to get to everything today. I think um, it's going to really require uh, some in-depth um, follow-up, uh, both with questions that we pose from the committee and get answers from you and your team. Mm -hmm. um, but but I do want to hone in on, on the contract yes. that... I referenced earlier in my opening statement, the auditor referenced in her testimony, and you also uh, mentioned in your testimony. Mm -hmm. um, but before we get there, just in terms of context, earlier this year, uh, February 3rd, 2023, to be exact, the city administrator sent you a letter raising um, a number of urgent concerns about uh, the state of the DIF system. Uh, specifically issues regarding the delay and accuracy of payment system, the reliability of real-time account balances, and the availability of comprehensive financial reporting. Uh, you, In your testimony, you provided slides that outline the OCFO's challenges and uh, the current focus. I want to be clear uh, in asking this question and, and getting your response clearly. Does do the challenges that you've outlined and the focus that you've articulated of the office today with respect to DIFF's implementation clearly align with the concerns and designed to address the concerns sure. laid out by the city administrator's office? Sure. I, from my perspective, the most important thing we do is process payments timely. And, and um, through the first quarter of the fiscal year, which would be October through December, we had several issues, several challenges mm -hmm. there. And um, 
uh, the city administrator and my organization were talking constantly about those problems. Uh, spoke to cabinet a couple of times as well. Um, and he accurately describes uh, more globally those challenges. And I think, um, you know, in, in a first year of implementation, two to three months is an eternity. We've made enormous strides um, addressing their concerns. There's really a couple key issues here. First, are we executing payments on time? In general, we believe we're executing payments and have the same late um, number of late payments as we did in SOAR. There's many reasons why payments are late, not just the financial system. We believe at this point in time that we're keeping up and making payments in a timely manner. So can I ask you, um, he had some specific ask in his letter. First, he asked that um, the two, uh, both his, his team and your team, scheduled biweekly check-in meetings to review the extent of the issues, projected timelines to resolve them, and the status of the work to stabilize this. Has that done? Has yes, that been we, done? we meet every two weeks. Yes, okay, sir. and it's, so those meetings are ongoing? Yes, sir. Okay. And we and talk then, about other issues, but clearly if there's a dis dis okay. issue, we address it. Yes, sir. Second, you said he designated a team at uh, the Chief Technology Officer's office to work alongside your team to finalize a plan to stabilize this. So that's that has already occurred and that team, those teams working together? We were constantly with their team in, in Octo, um, primarily around the issues of integrating information from all of the other systems that provide information that lead to financial transactions. So is there a plan to finalize um well, actually, is there a final plan to stabilize DIFFs, I guess is the question. We believe that um, we're addressing the major DIFFs issues. But not not in the way that he had requested, not in the way that it, it lays out a finalized we have, plan. We believe we're achieving the uh, solutions to the concerns that he uh, described here. Okay. To, to be honest with you, um, I, I believe strongly having another party help us uh, um, with this kind of planning is an essential part of stabilization. And by another party, you reference in the guidehouse contract? Yes, sir. And, okay. Yes, sir. And, and then finally, he asked that you provide weekly reports to district agencies that include year-to-date expenditures by CSG, vendor payments made, and a list of vendor payments that are more than 30 days past due. Uh, is are those weekly reports with the information that he uh, requested being provided? Some were not as uh, standardized in providing to him and senior uh, cabinet members routinely. However, our associate CFOs are working uh, daily with agency directors and program managers to provide this information for their management purposes. Okay, how would you characterize? The posture that your office is in with the CF, with the office of the city administrator with respect to this letter, the items that are listed here as serious concerns, and where you are with progress on resolving those concerns. The core issue of not making payments or or making payments in an emergency status, I think, is improving dramatically. Um, uh, we work with Octo on specific integration issues, constantly integration, meaning data exchanges between systems they manage and, and DIFFs. Um, I, uh, I believe we can do better with reporting as he envisions. Um, my reporting assets, frankly, need to be uh, prioritized to support program and financial managers. Okay, and and that's that was a decision I made, and it's not. Yeah, I'm sure we'll reach conflict, out conflict, but it's it's. Um, I only have a limited number of people, so I well, I need those frontline reports to program managers and financial managers. Speaking of about limited number of people, uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that the, the auditor mentioned in her testimony, and I asked about in follow up, was sound like a reduction in FTEs within. Uh, your office, I think specifically maybe management and budget um, that would 
do some of this work around the budget module. And she referenced, um, I think, some cuts that occurred uh, several years ago, um, several administrations ago, in fact. Yes. But it sounds like uh, those th th that there's very few FTEs left to do some of the things that have been done with respect to uh, performance-based budgeting uh, today. And so I want to allow you to respond to that, but sure. then I also want to get your response to a number of other items that the, the auditor has raised. Sure. Are you familiar with what she's talking about? Maybe if not the his you know, the history of yeah. how no, I, about. I, I am, I'm not, I, I, it, you have any but reaction I, though? To, I do. To, yes, to, I do. I do. Actually, my experience with performance-based budgeting is it's only as successful as the executive and legislative branches that want it to be. In other words, if, if a, if a mayor or governor doesn't present their budget in that context, or a legislature doesn't evaluate budget choices around those performance measures, then those systems don't sustain themselves. I have no idea what happened here. Uh, it's years ago, as she pointed out. But I've observed where a lot of energy has gone into these uh, efforts and they've lost steam. And, and so that's my observation. But I, again, don't know the specifics that she was referring to. Are you familiar with uh, that, that section of the code? I believe it's 47-308. Uh, on performance-based budgets? Um, not, I am not familiar with it. However, if it is an issue with uh, the legislative branch, we are happy to develop working with the executive, the metrics you're looking for that meet, that match then the financial decision you're making. But no, I, I specifically want you and your, your team to familiarize yourself with that because I'd like to get your response and follow-up with respect sure. to whether or not you're actually complying with it. And if not, uh, what uh, steps do you plan to take to come into compliance with uh, that section of the code? And then I also want to get your response to a few things um, that the auditor's testimony referenced uh, with respect to to Guidehouse and the, and the gap analysis. Uh, how do you respond to the concerns that the auditor raised there? Um two different points in time. And uh, the, um, the fit gap analysis you do initially, which is what Deloitte was um, hired to do, is to develop the business processes as I discussed. Uh, what are best practices? What is the um, jurisdiction doing? And what is the new system that you're looking to purchase, in this case, Oracle provide? And so how do you triangulate your past versus best practice versus what the new system does. Fit gap here means relative to what we want to accomplish, how our, our business is processed. Are we actually efficient in doing that? Have we engineered the processes correctly? And are they consistent with best practice? You may have goals you established three, four years ago, but by the time you go through configuration implementation, are you still achieving those? That's that's the question. And that's so, in some so, cases like the uh, expense form that we described or the expense um, reimbursement. Uh, clearly, that was um, an area where we can improve. I want to give you an opportunity to do something that I think would help yes, sir. Uh, my colleagues and clarify the need for the contract with Gardner. Uh, what specifically is within the scope of work under the guidehouse contract that is currently unfulfilled and doesn't overlap with anything that you would be contracting Gardner to do in terms of its scope of work? Right. Draw a distinction between you know, what you had guidehouse do with respect to uh, diffs that was distinct from Deloitte's responsibility. Uh, and then what exactly is Gartner going to be contracted to do um, right. with the no, contract? I, 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 yes. So Gartner. Yeah. What? what yeah. I'm I understand. Yeah. yeah, I understand. So Gartner is the entity that reports to your project manager that says 
that the implementation or the implementer, Deloitte and our staff are moving along, accomplishing within the timelines they need to all the steps to implement a new system. They're not necessarily uh, active in evaluating intimately the configuration decisions, business process. My experience is you hire a Gartner equivalent to evaluate whether the process is moving along as you expect. Oftentimes they'll bring expertise saying, you know, that step in a procurement doesn't make sense to us. You might want to look at that again, but they're evaluating whether you're making, achieving your goals and are, are on time and within budget. That's their primary responsibility. And they'll continue with that role in uh, developing our budget uh, as we develop our homegrown, if you will, budget system. Um, what we're asking Guidehouse to do is to get into the details, to understand exactly what it is we're doing across a wide variety of processes to evaluate whether there's any uh, mis um, uh, missteps in the transactions, any recording mistakes that are occurring. In other words, we're not recording transactions appropriately as the system is designed and, and get ahead of potential problem areas. That's very different. And, so and, give us a sense of what the types of things that Gartner identified along the way. And frankly, talk about Deloitte and its contract uh, with respect to organizational change management and whether anything remains outstanding on that or whether there are things that were done um, unsatisfactorily. Um, give, give us a sense of whether Deloitte has completed fully uh, its work and, and what's the timeline with Gartner? Right, so for Deloitte, they have completed their work um, or within the next three or four days, uh, working days, they will be complete and their contracts that will then be over. Um, they're leaving sooner than we anticipated because when the executive did not fund the budget module, uh, we did no longer needed Deloitte to stay another hour, a year to a year and a half to implement the budget module. So per terms of the contract, they are um, effectively offsite at the end of this month. Um, we, we did have concerns that uh, were raised by the auditor. Uh, we've worked with Deloitte and at this moment in time, we believe that uh, they're leaving in good stead. And, um, um, you know, it, it, and I think her question very specifically, was there specific deficiencies that they uh, are leaving us or problems they're leaving us? The reality is implementation is a partnership between your own staff and, and your implementer. And um, we have worked out over the year, over the last few months, issues that we would have had in, in December, some of the issues that I've highlighted, our staff has, has made extraordinary gains in, in solving some of the problems. So your uh, understanding is that they didn't fail to deliver on any aspect of the contract, Deloitte? Uh, um, that is correct. Okay. And talk about Gartner in terms of where they are with their work and, and the timeline for them completing um, their responsibilities under the contract. Yeah, under the contract, I believe they will complete their work at the end of December and their primary responsibility is to do the same oversight assessment of, of uh, the budget system implementation. Um, and because we were not funded, we had to stop the project. Um, um, and now because we're funded again to implement the budget module, we'll start that up. Uh, much later, so that, such that we needed still an interim program to, developed, and they will help oversee that we're following our own deadlines and process goals. That's their primary responsibility. Uh, so who's going to actually do the budget work, the work on the budget module? My staff. Your staff. My staff is doing an interim program. It will not be nearly system, it will not be nearly as robust as the Oracle uh, module, nor is it likely to be sustainable. 
But at least um, because we lost the four months between when the executive told us they would not fund implementing the budget module until the council chose to fund it, we have to delay a year. So we're developing a uh, interim system to uh, get us through the formulation of fiscal year 25. All right. I mean, uh, the response you gave raises some concerns um, for me, uh, and, and this is going to be a particular area of focus of the committee and working with the chairman, um, frankly, given his role in oversight of the Office of Management and Budget. Um, I wanted to just just follow up. I thought it was a, a good question that the uh, the auditor had raised with respect to Gardner. Um, she had asked in her testimony if Gardner had provided the services as contracted throughout the implementation process, and more specifically, whether the regular reports that the uh, four and five contractor was required to submit to the district identified any of the issues that is anticipated the new gap analysis contractor will be addressing. No. Do you need me to repeat that? No. So, so no. the answer is no? No. And I I would expect Guidehouse to identify issues that, that Gardner wouldn't even see. Uh, it's, a, again, a different responsibility, a different level. The, the Gu Guidehouse will be looking at the details, understanding every process that we've engineered, looking at, at issues that we haven't even executed yet, financial processes we haven't even executed yet at a detailed level. Gardner was not hired to do that. They were hired to ensure that we met our time and, and um, money obligations to implement the system. Uh, assuming the contract with Guidehouse is approved. Yes, sir. When would you anticipate uh, that everything is executed and they would begin their work? Um, I am told by my staff literally a day or two after um it's approved and, and, does, and that is our that's that's our goal every does day your staff now. have the capacity to do the work with god house while the work with gardner is ongoing I, um we have the capacity to support guide house's detailed assessments yes uh, we don't have the capacity to do them ourselves. That's why we have another firm uh, doing the assessments, the detailed assessments and problem solving. But as, as Gartner finishes out its work, mm -hmm. are the same staffers going to have additional responsibility to work with Guidehouse? Um, I don't expect an overlap between supporting Gardner's assessment of the progress on our budget system and um, the detailed work at looking at the financial system dips. I don't expect an overlap. I don't expect a time conflict. Um, Gartner will actually be helpful in our Guidehouse work with Guidehouse evaluating because they will bring institutional memory to bear the different steps of different processes. So we see it as a real advantage. The, um, give me one second.
One of the recurring concerns we've heard from stakeholders is the inability to generate transaction level detailed reports with DIFFs and the lack of a unified general ledger. Uh, are you familiar with those concerns uh, and will those issues be addressed? Um, for the former reporting, um, yes, we expect Guidehouse's work to help us with our reporting. My experience has been that reporting takes several months to implement, if not longer. Um, and there's a variety of reasons. Every system provides more or less out of the box reporting capacities that if people use the system correctly are very accurate, but they're not exactly what people are used to or, um, and, um, and so there's um, usually a need for customizing reports that can take a year or two to fully implement. I, I, in addition, you, you find the technology platform for reporting using the system as opposed to a data warehouse is uh, an issue you have to address. Um, um, so we're evaluating all of those kinds of issues. First, what are customized reports people are used to that we should replicate? And second, um, should we at our within our budget uh, have a, a, a shadow information system not shadow, it's, it's a daily download of the system that people can use and then create their own reports and so forth. That's a very common solution. I've implemented two of those before. And uh, so we're looking- Let me at ask those. you though, before before yes. we, we wrap up, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've heard you mention two years, you know, it takes a while to implement these yep. new financial systems. And I guess what I'm trying to figure out is do you have though a sense of a timeline to resolve the major issues that have been identified like the ones that uh the city administrator has identified um and and do you expect to be able to do that with the funding that you currently have in your budget absolutely and How, if, if at all, will these challenges that you're working to address and that you hope to be able to address uh, with a new contractor, do, does any of this affect um, the work that you're going to have to do with the, the audit, uh, the, the ACFR? Well, if anything, it, it will help us. <clears throat> they can help us evaluate some of the year-end processes to make sure that uh, we've we've designed them correctly. Now, as I mentioned, my staff is proactively doing simulated year-end processes now. They're doing one literally right now. We'll do another one, I believe in about a month and a half to try to identify um, issues of not only closing out the year, generating a report, but also opening up a new year. So so let's play this out. Mm -hmm. um, how, how long do you expect the contract with God House? What are the terms of that in terms of timeline? Um, I believe it's one year with two to three option years, but um, yeah, I believe those are the terms. That okay. gives us flexibility, but I, should, I, should I we, need to- Should you need four, four option years in, a con, in this contract? I, I don't expect. I'd be surprised. And I, I you know, I, um, we provided ourselves flexibility, but I'm I'm um, extremely focused on not asking for more resources from okay. the district to pay for the system. So, and let's play that contract out to to the end. Mm -hmm. um, who on you? Who, who do you expect is going to follow up on any recommendations that Godhouse actually produces as a result of this contract? We won't need another contract to implement what no, Godhouse no. recommends. No, no, no. The, the, um, Hopefully Guidehouse can help design solutions and help implement them. And that's my experience in the past. Um, but the primary um, implementers will be either our, our business owners, which would be budget, Eric Kennedy, uh, accounting and payroll is Kimberly Williams and treasury is Carmen Pigler or our systems people, if it's strictly a systems uh, issue, Alok Chada and his team will implement. Okay. 
Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there, there are a series of, of questions that I think get more into the details of the contracts with Deloitte and Gardner that I am going to pose sure. to your office through the committee and, and would like to get those responses in short order. I'm also going to uh, have my team uh, reach out to the committee as a whole um, with respect to the Office of Management and Budget on some of these items. And we're going to follow up with your office. Yes, sir. Um, if you're referring to the questions from the auditor as the basis, we received um, that report last night. So I'm sorry, I'm not able to answer okay. them all fluently right now. There's one thing I want to ask um, about the budget application mm -hmm. that you all are working on. Yes. What plans, if any, do you all have to make it more user-friendly um, for you know, council, for members of the public? Um, is that within your thought process as you as you all are moving forward with this? In general, be. yes. In, in general, um, uh, we have we use stakeholders or work with stakeholders, including the council's uh, financial staff, to uh, develop the parameters of a new budget module. Um, um, what you asked about was two very different things. First, what what how do we support your budget deliberation process best or better than we do now with different kinds of information that's very tactical discussions between um, Ms. Budoff and our team and and she needs to be intimately part of this the second of a more public facing um, um, budget display interactive budget systems that you see on the market right now we would love to engage with you on that that's probably supportable certainly by the Oracle system, no doubt about that, the Oracle budget module. Uh, would love to engage with you in the longer run about how that could work here. There's many products on the market that we could replicate, not need to buy, but yeah. replicate and would love to uh, discuss that more with you. No, no you should ex ex certainly expect to engage with, with me and the committee uh, more routinely throughout the implementation of DIFFs given uh, what's led up to it. Now, I want to acknowledge that you weren't here the entire time uh, throughout this process, but you're here now. Uh, and and uh, as chair, I plan to 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 engage uh, in more routine oversight around the implementation of DIFFs, mm -hmm. uh, working with my colleagues on the committee, uh, working with the chairman and the auditor to make sure this gets done uh, not only correctly, but also more uh, efficiently in terms of timing and cost. Uh, and so that should be the expectation you have leaving here. I want to thank you for your testimony and asking these questions. Uh, there certainly will be uh, lots more follow-up on this. I also want to thank the auditor uh, for testifying this morning. Is there anything else you'd like to add to the little record, Mr. Lee, before no, I sir. adjourn? No, sir. Okay. Good to be here. This marks the end of today's oversight roundtable. The committee will continue to follow up with the Office of the Chief Financial Officer and other district stakeholders regarding uh, DIFFs. Uh, the time is now... On 12, 14 a.m. and this roundtable is adjourned.